This month for Maddie's Baking Book Club, we read the book Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Gormas. This book, although going into it, I thought there were going to be tons of food options to choose from to inspire my book, Inspired Bake. Um, there were actually surprisingly few foods that really struck me as things I wanted to create in a macaron. But then in chapter 29, uh, Elizabeth, our main character, is trying to explain uh, bonds in chemistry, chemical bonds, and is using them as a comparison for different types of marriage and relationships. So she describes covalent bonds as something when two different things are stronger together. And she describes this as a party where, um, you bring the pie and he brings the wine. So anyway, I decided why not make a wine pie macaron inspired by Elizabeth's kind of description, food description to describe something both social and scientific that felt very true to the story. As I've been chatting, I made a cherry compote. It had red wine, cherries, gelatin, and a little bit of pectin. That's because I wanted it to thicken up and I wanted to include a lot of wine in there. So I had a lot of liquid and alcohol. So I wanted those to help strengthen it up. Now I'm making some French method macarons, just my very usual process. I love to mix uh, golden yellow and brown, or you can use any brown and any yellow, whatever you prefer. When I am making something that is supposed to look like bread or dough or cake or anything like that, because the yellow really helps soften the brown and give it that baked item feeling. So for these pie macarons, I really wanted to make sure it was not a chocolate brown, but it was a baked brown. Then after those macarons baked and cooled, I'm adding the pie decoration. So I split my royal icing into two different batches. One is going to be red because it's a cherry pie. So I have a looser red royal icing here. I'm using red and burgundy because I want it to have that like rich, dark wine cherry feeling. I don't want it to be like bright candy cherry. And then to the other royal icing, I'm adding again brown and yellow to give it that baked item sort of brown. Now for this brown, I just have the finished shells next to me and I'm just trying to color match as best as I can. Then when everything is finally ready, it's time to add the decoration, which is definitely the most challenging part of this macaron. I decided to paint on my red royal icing so I could have some texture and that cherry pie appearance without wasting all of my time piping little cherries or something like that. So I painted that on and then let that dry a little bit before I added on the next bits of royal icing decoration. Then the next step, I wanted to have a lattice style, but instead of doing a true lattice, I just did horizontal lines, then turned it and did some more lines so that all the lines would be perpendicular. And this is a relatively thick royal icing, but it's loose enough that it will pipe very easily in nice lines. And it's not really going to spread anywhere, but it will sink down just a little bit. Then the remaining brown that is the same brown color that again is as close to the shell color as I can get it, then that is going to be really, really, really stiff. So with that royal icing, you want to split the batch, reserve some of that stiff batter, the royal icing, once you have colored it how you want, and then add a bit of water or extract to thin out the brown for what you want for the lattice. I didn't use a piping tip on that part, but I am using a pedal piping tip to pipe this little squiggly line for the outside crust of the pie. If you do not have a very small piping tip, 
I do not know what size this is. I just have a small piping tip that is petal shaped. Um, I think it is Wilton. I, it might be a Teco. I'm not sure. Um, but you can also just cut your piping bag at an angle and it will be okay. You actually can do this without a piping tip. But like a lot of things, it is just really nice to have this kind of piping tip on hand. I find that I use it a lot, not only for flowers, but for detail work like this. You don't have to go quite as squiggly and back and forth. You can kind of choose the wave style you want for the outside of your pie. I did a bunch of different varieties that you'll see in the final versions of these macarons. And then I just made sure to let this dry completely. So I left it at room temperature just on my counter for a couple hours before I moved on to the filling. If you leave this wet and you go to fill this and then put it in your refrigerator, you might cause some craters to form and it might not dry properly and then it will be sticky or gooey and it could smear and smudge everywhere later. So it's really important that you give that time to dry. The very last thing for these macarons before we can fill them is an ermine buttercream. I wanted to have a flour-based buttercream with just a pinch of cinnamon because I wanted it to feel like a pie, but I did not feel like going through all of the effort for making and crumbling up a pie crust to put into the buttercream. So I decided I would go with this. And then because I wanted to keep this a book-inspired bake, again, really leaning into that he brings the wine, she brings the pie <laughs> vibe. I added more of the red wine that I used in my cherry compote into my buttercream. So with the addition of the wine, we have this really lovely looking purple flower mixture. Once that's cooled, I'm whipping up my butter and then I'll stream in that cooled wine flower uh, sort of pudding like <laughs> creation because of the addition of the whipped butter it's not going to be quite as purple as it looks when it was in the saucepan but it is a really nice mauvey sort of color now that every element is done i am going to go ahead and fill these macarons just like any macaron that has two different fillings, I'm going in with one nice big ring of that buttercream, then I'll scoop in the cherry compote. Depending on how you cook your cherries, if you leave them whole like I did, you can just scoop one right in. If you went in there with an immersion blender to break that up or after they're finished cooking, you can use a food processor or an immersion blender to break them up again, then you could just pipe that cherry filling in. So it really depends on the texture you want for the inside of your macarons. So for me, I'm just using a little spoon and scooping just about one cherry in there, but because I used two different thickening agents, some of that extra kind of jelly mixture is also going in there, which is adding to the flavor and texture for these macarons. So now all that is left, I need to sandwich these together and get them into my refrigerator to mature completely. Even with this royal icing design, it's not going to take much longer than usual to mature and it is a uh, soft but not too soft filling, still about one to two days and these will be perfect to dive into. Okay, now it is time for a little book discussion, so stay tuned if you're interested on my thoughts on lessons in chemistry. Hi everyone, welcome to this month's Baking Book Club discussion. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you so much to Lisa Carol Bakes. You can find her on Instagram. She has been participating in my baking book club since the beginning of the year and I asked her if she wanted to choose a book. She gave me a couple and this sounded like just the perfect choice for this time of a year. Not only because Lessons in Chemistry had been on my TBR for a while, I was seeing it everywhere. Every time I passed a bookstore, it was always in the window or like right when you walked in the door. Um, but also this month, October 2023, 
Um, Lessons in Chemistry is now also a TV show, which I haven't watched yet, um, but I'm excited to check that out and see how true it is to the book. So again, thank you to Lisa Carol Bakes. It is so wonderful to have other people choosing books that I might not pick for myself or I might not choose right away, especially for this baking book club. It's been really fun to read a whole bunch of different genres. So Lessons in Chemistry is historical fiction. Um, it is not about a true person, but this book takes place in like the late 50s through 1960s era. Um, and along with that, we are seeing a lot of this sort of uh, I'm gonna say pre-feminist uh, era where we have our main character Elizabeth Zott and she is a chemist but as a woman she is really really struggling in academia in this time. There are not a lot of other women who feel comfortable pushing the boundaries quite as much as our main character feels and is determined because there is just so much pushback and a lot of women are just kind of pigeonholed into being um, housewives or if they are in the workforce they are you know secretaries or things like that jobs where you know they're assisting the men in these different roles um, and going on to higher education getting your master's degree getting your doctorate it's not really something that happens much and the women who are attempting this who are pursuing this path are often not only harassed, um, but just treated incredibly poorly. And we see a little bit of that pretty early on in the story. So this book focuses on Elizabeth, our main character, on her journey as a woman in the field of chemistry, and then also how her passion for chemistry kind of spreads out into other aspects of her life and how she uses that in, her life as a partner, as a mother, um, and then also she winds up on this TV show and starts spreading her love for chemistry through cooking um, on a much bigger platform through TV. Um, from this point on, I'm going to get into a lot of spoilers, so if you haven't read the book or don't want to know what happens, um, please run away and I'll see you in the next video. Before I do say more about the story itself though, I do want to say that this was a really, really unique writing style for me. And although I ended up really liking it for this book, I do not think it's a style I could read often or even more than a couple times without um, being a little bit weirded out or feeling a little bit, I don't know, like ADD reading it. Um, I read a lot of romance novels and I read a lot of fantasy and in those genres it is really common to have dual perspectives where you have one character narrating one chapter and then the next chapter it's going to jump from somebody else's perspective so you are jumping back and forth. However, in romance and in fantasy it is usually quite structured. This chapter is this person, this chapter is this other person. In Lessons in Chemistry, sometimes paragraph to paragraph, we were getting different perspectives. And while most of the story was told from Elizabeth's perspective, there were other parts of the story that were told not just from, um, I guess we would consider him a male lead, though he is not in the entire book, Calvin's perspective, but then also like a random person at work a secretary, the person at the TV studio she works with, like so many other people, we would suddenly get a paragraph or a page of their perspective. And it was really interesting, but because it was not clear, sometimes it was a very sudden shift and then it would shift back again with no warning. So writing that must have been very challenging and reading it again was fun for this book but if every book was written in this style I would not be a fan. <laughs> so I am curious if anybody else has read Lessons in Chemistry what they thought of this writing style that was a little bit like 
oh, suddenly it's this other person's perspective. Oh no, it's this other person's perspective. It was really different for me. Um, I will say that I, in the first couple of chapters, I was a little bit skeptical about the book. Um, and I have heard from a couple other people as well that um, it was really over the top Elizabeth is a feminist kind of a vibe and in the beginning even though that is so much related to the story it felt a little bit in your face especially in the beginning um and I can see how that would be a little bit hard even though like everything she was doing like it was so great and I wanted to read about her but sometimes it felt over the top like I want to know about other parts of her life. I want to know about the other things. I want to know about Elizabeth. I don't want to just know about how hard she is fighting against the system. Like that is so great. And I want to know those things, but I also want to know other things. I want to know about her personality in other ways. I want to know about her life in other ways. Um, so that, and I do think as I read, the more we got to know about her, about the other characters, um, but the first couple of chapters, I was a little bit apprehensive, um, and I have heard that others have felt the same way, so that's something else I'm curious as a reader, how you felt about how overt the message was about feminism and Elizabeth's perspective of feminism. So in the story, we jump right in to where Elizabeth is going to work on this TV show. Um, and then we jump back several years. And throughout the story, we are kind of in the present, in the past, in the present, in the past, in different parts of the past and in different years. And there's a lot happening. So again, like the writing style of different perspectives, it was very interesting in that in a way that was like, we're putting puzzle pieces together. We're learning all of these little crumbs of detail, but for the first many chapters, we didn't have enough information to really understand where some of these different messages were going. So again, if you are just in the first couple of chapters and if you don't binge read like I do and just zoom through half of the book um, or the entire book in one sitting, I could also see how you might feel a bit confused in the beginning. So once I really got into the book, I I cried a couple times. Like it got me emotionally. I you know from the cover, you know that Elizabeth ends up a single mother. So that's not a surprise that the story is going in that direction. However, when you open the book, after the first chapter, we start hearing about this guy, Calvin, and we hear about how much of a jerk he is, how he is selfish and holds grudges and just seems like the worst guy. And just with how they set up this character, I fully expected Elizabeth to be a single mother because, I mean, you could see that they were, you know, maybe ending up together, but... I kind of thought that it was either going in the direction of like there was a trauma and she ended up pregnant or maybe they had a consensual relationship and then he was just the worst and left and abandoned them. I did not think they were going to fall in love. I did not expect that. And I also, huge spoiler alert, I did not expect him to die so suddenly and in like such a dramatic and sad way he's walking the dog and it's this huge deal because they have this dog and usually it's not on the leash and they decide to get a leash and elizabeth is like no 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 you need to have him on a leash and then because of the leash calvin is pulled directly in front of a car and is run over like it is so i i cried it was very sudden and very traumatic um, reading that, I uh, did not expect that to happen. So then as we continue on, Elizabeth is like a shell of herself and finds out she's pregnant and has to deal with being a mother. She's fired from her job at the same time. So like, she is just completely alone. She basically has no friends. Um, so 
yeah, it was a little bit challenging to read how much of a struggle she was having. That was really hard. She doesn't have family. Again, like all of her coworkers either looked down on her or disliked her or were envious of her. And so she has basically no one. Um, and so, yeah, just a really, really hard time. Luckily, her neighbor is amazing and kind of starts checking in on her and then they become this kind of little mini chosen family unit, which I really enjoyed. I think the part about the book that I liked the most, um, actually the, the two parts that I really enjoyed. Um, the first part was the cooking show that Elizabeth is on. In the beginning, it's supposed to be like, she's this really attractive young woman who's gonna teach like really basic things to other housewives. And Elizabeth, like this is her stubborn streak coming through that I think might annoy some readers, but she's like, I don't care. I don't care, I'm gonna do what I want. I like, does not care about the ratings, does not care about her boss, does not care about, the production company, like she is adamant that she is going to teach cooking as chemistry and use all these big words and use scientific process and all of this. And she is just like, that is happening. And in the beginning, it's really stressful for the reader too, because we're like, just, just like bend a little bit, right? Like compromise, like a tiny little bit. Oh my gosh, because this is a huge platform and it's a really big deal and it's good money and it's security for you and your daughter. Um, but as she goes on, she is inspiring all these other women who start saying, oh, look at her doing that. Look at her talking about that. Look at her encouraging other women to do this. Um, and I really love that. I love that she was doing something that inspired people first one at a time and then by the hundreds. People love her. They love this channel. Um, so I, I really liked that part of the story that even though it was a bit uncomfortable in the beginning with how uncompromising she was, in the end, when she was true to herself, it worked out for her. The other part of the story that I loved, and it seemed kind of, um, not that the story felt super realistic in some ways, but her daughter, the <laughs> is legally named mad because she like f was delirious when she gave birth and didn't give her a full name so she sometimes I think calls her Maddie but the, her name is just mad um her daughter's brilliant like absolutely brilliant and super creative and this kid is just like really lovely to read about um and i think what i really liked about this little girl is that while she has a lot of the brilliance of her mother right she's four or five years old and she is like fully reading chapter books right like she is so bright she is a genius um so we see a lot of similarities to Elizabeth and Calvin, but even in this very tiny child, we see a level of like social awareness um, that maybe her parents didn't have. And that's really interesting to see from a very bright child. Um, so I did really like that aspect of the story and the chapters and parts with that were focused a little bit more on her and her figuring out, you know, just life from the perspective of a child, especially a child that is in, especially for the time this is to be set in, a very unusual family, right? Single parent, um, her parents weren't married, so a lot of, you know, kind of stigma and drama is surrounded around this child, um, and she's kind of navigating that and doing a really good job of it. I think as far as rating this book, I think I would give it a four out of five, um, mostly because it, uh, it surprised me, and I think that even though the story wasn't 
maybe perfect. Um, some of the writing style, again, like they were things that were fun to read and experience this one time. <laughs> um, I really did like a lot of things about the story. There were definitely things that I wasn't a huge fan of. Again, some of Elizabeth's like single-minded focus and determination to do some things instead of being like really inspiring, especially in the beginning, just felt like really kind of uncomfortable to watch and read about. So some of those things were maybe not my favorite, uh, but I definitely would recommend this book um, to people who are our fans of historical fiction or this sort of um, female underdog, <laughs> women in STEM sort of book. I would say though that again, the writing style might not be for everyone. Um, and because Elizabeth has this cooking TV show, I thought that there was going to be a lot more experimentation and like discussion of food. And when there was discussion of food, it was very interesting, but it was more from like a, this is the chemical process sort of way. But the food was very like, pie and brownies and coffee and like potatoes and like they were just very normal foods and I guess even for this time period I thought maybe with the chemistry there would be some more unique foods or there would be more complicated foods she's going to be doing some crazy things and all of that but I guess it is the 60s <laughs> um so yeah I I was surprised based on how much the food TV show was brought up, even just on the back cover. I thought there was going to be a lot more food involved. So if you're picking this up because you want a foodie read, you're not going to find that. <laughs> so I actually had a little bit of a hard time deciding what to do for my book Inspired Bake because there aren't that many foods even talked about in the book. Um, so for a while I thought I'd just have to be inspired by like her or like something that wasn't necessarily even food at all. So yes, at the end of the day, I did enjoy it. It was a nice read. I'm happy I read it. I would recommend it, but I can also see that it's not necessarily for everyone. If you have read this, I would love to know what your thoughts were. Let me know in the comment section. Um, what did you think? What did you love? What did you not love? How would you read this book? And yeah, thank you so much for following along with my book inspired bake and this little book discussion today. We have two more Maddie's Baking Book Club uh, books and bakes for 2023. I cannot believe we're already 10 months into this. Um, next month, the book is Whale. It is a Korean historical fiction, magical realism sort of book. And then the last book is going to be a lot more lighthearted. It's another cozy mystery just to end the year on a cozy and sweet note. So if you haven't already checked out, I do have a list of those books um, in one of my previous Maddie's Baking Book Club um, update videos. And then also you can find them in my Maddie's Baking Book Club highlight on Instagram anytime you want. All right, thanks for staying tuned and I will see you in my next video. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.